Hello everyone and thank you for coming back to the channel. We're going to be talking about Portia's Pursuit of Portia and her book. Five and six chapters. Full of shit, basically. Wasn't really nothing to really talk about. I don't understand why she regurgitated so much stuff that most uh, newlyweds go through. Or when you're in the courting session of wanting to um, be with someone, build a life with someone. And eventually get married and live life with one another and hopefully it be very prosperous and loving and y'all can be growing old together but actually in her chapters chapter um, five and six she just gives us a long overview of what she should have um, left to the dust but it was her own uh, selfish way of wanting to get married you know she had stopped liking the club scene she had went up to some club here in Bucket I've never heard of before but I'm not a club going person I mean I did that when I was like 17 and 18 19 years old and I knew that just wasn't the life for me uh, so it just is what it is but she went to some club called Tongue and Groove in Buckhead it's probably with the white folks um, an affluent type uh, diversity type of I don't think it was an urban set of a um, nightclub or whatnot. I think it was something more of a diversity but an upscale type of club setting and um, her, her girlfriend we're going out, you know, to the same club, just redundant. Everything's just, you know, here, or there, nowhere. And she was trying to drown herself uh, uh, in the music and the al alcohol in the scene of just being in the midst of everything. And she felt like it was different this time. Uh, she felt she had like a supernatural calling because she kind of blanked out herself and went into another... I guess dimension or whatever and you know she was already asking the Lord in her mind what is she doing here why is she here this is not fulfilling and she pretty much said um, she had an epiphany from her words quickly she said um, she said my eyes were wide open but everything went pitch black pitch black and I knew it wasn't the alcohol because I had only had a couple of drinks this was different it was supernatural drowning out the bass heavy songs that vibrated through the tucked away speaker surrounding me a voice said to me very clearly come out from where you are so you can bring them to me okay she said she was shocked or even scared to hear God's voice it was the most familiar voice I had ever heard almost like my own honestly I, I was relieved because after years of speaking to God pleading with him and asking him so many questions I have from my, from my life he finally answered like many sacred things in life I found God thanks to my mother although I have known God all my life um, since like no other like any other black person in Atlanta I had grown up in the church it wasn't until my late 20s that I truly took time to get to know him and allow him to the opportunity to get to know me so she was in her 20s and for some reason her and her mom got an epiphany that they were going to take church more seriously so they found this little small <coughs> baptist church here in atlanta she don't get the details on the name which i kind of found found weird because if you really like this house of worship and they were doing the darn thing why wouldn't you put it out on the map for other people to try to go and partake of that service if they lived in that area but for some reason she didn't think enough of her uh, pastor of the church or anything because she just omitted it totally out and it was a small type setting church she also had uh, put in here as well um, but when they invited other evangelists or preachers to come they pretty much stocked up their church with people um, so uh, let's see and she was saying her mom started um, serving as an evangelist in the smaller church. And um, that made Portia feel good about herself because they were both coming back to their roots or whatnot. Okay, Portia was saying she was trying to become an evangelist herself. 
uh, she started taking the word uh, more, uh, more, what do you call it, more seriously, for lack of a better word. Uh, she needed a divine reset. She said her and her mom went to church every single Sunday and many days in between. I guess Bible study and um, I don't know what else she was doing up in now. But she was a part of the praise team. Uh, and she even noted one time everybody was giving their own day or each Sunday somebody was going to do a solo. Because I think they only had like a four member choir. So... Uh, you know, Portia said she could sing. Her mother had said she could sing. She was should have been all about that business, right? But child, when she got up in front of all those people, and at the time that the uh, pastor or the uh, musical ministry had decided that Portia was going to lead a solo, the, um, this pastor had came in from another church and packed the church with his congregation, uh, and <laughs> it was time to put. For, it was time for Portia to go up for a uh, solo. And she just said everything went black. I was like, what? She said, when the song finally got to my part, I could barely breathe. Like, alone, let alone singing. I might, I might have left out a Jesus by the time I finished singing his name. I was on the floor. I kid you not. I saw blackness. I literally, literally hit the floor, passed out. Not a little bit. No, out. Like, stone out. Cold out. When I came to, all I heard around me was my church family saying the Holy Ghost done got in the porch. Praise them, praise them. They were fanning me and asking me, was I sure I was okay? Meanwhile, to cover up my embarrassment, I hopped up and joined the rest of the congregation saying, Jesus save me, Jesus save me. God, please forgive me. And I'm like, Portia, was this like a, a stunt you were playing or whatnot? I mean, I know people have anxiety real bad. And that's something you should have really talked about to your pastor your min music or ministry so let them know you just have an illness you have a fright you have a phobia it's a mental thing and you can never at this time uh be able to be put on the spot for a solo you know i would have just been honest with the situation if that's what it was but then you were saying you want to be a uh in the secular world singing god uh god forbidden music you know with the bumping and the grinding and all the salacious things going on you can get up on the microphone and do that but you can't sing in the house of the lord to get a lot of praise here and there girl that's a hot mess but for those who want to believe it go on this is just her words her personal autobiography or how she feel okay um she goes on to say i have grown so much in my relationship with god that it had transformed me into actual relationship was more fulfilling than any job any man any drink any drug any shopping spree he was more than enough he was greater he was my comforter he was my peace yes Portia we all feel that uh, most of us more than others but as I look at your life now you know where is the God in you because it seems like you backslid or you were backsliding because now you still like the luxurious shopping sprees I don't know about any drugs. That's you, not me saying it. We know you like a good drink, a brown piece of alcohol, some Hennessy. Um, and you're still chasing out the men. You're still chasing out that fame, fortune, and prestige. You want to definitely always be in the limelight. So again, I'm trying to figure out, want to know about it. Where's the growth for us? Where's the growth? I see a lot of backsliding. I saw I see praising, but I see a lot more backsliding than anything else in chapter five and six. Okay, um, she goes on to say, you know, praising the Lord and stuff like that. Um, I don't know. I don't know what report she's really doing in this chapter. She goes on to say, with God, I could forgive myself for the choices I have made, the men I chose who only disappointed me. With God, I could set myself free. I could break the chains of regret, shame, guilt, and live a life filled with purpose, contentment, and clarity. Okay? Then she goes on to say, but it didn't mean that I let church or that confining religious lifestyle, which is hypocritical judgments and shaming techniques, change who I was or how I carried myself. Well, in many ways it did. The best ways, but what I mean is that I truly believe that God loved me just as I was. I still woke up. I still wore, uh, I still wore makeup. I still wore clothes that fit my body um, despite trouble. Uh, 
I uh, still wear clothes that fit my body despite getting in trouble for wearing skirts that were too tight for church because I knew my heart wasn't being disrespectful. Well, you know, in the Bible it does say dress accordingly, Portia. Uh, and if I may emphasize and just give a, a summary, you don't want to show all your assets, baby. That's enticing people. That's that's being a part of the flesh. And that's something that you really shouldn't have been doing in the first place. You know, that's sinful. You know, you come in some clothes that are just not. Don't put it all where it's tight and you can see the prints of everything, baby. That's pretty much what the church congregation should have been saying. They ain't saying dress like a pauper. Because she did go in here and say that a lot of... Her church members and, and, and choir people she hung around and stuff. They wore um, skirts down to the, uh, the ankles. Now, we do know there is some flattering skirts that, you know, don't hug the body well. But there, you know, especially in the winter time, you want to dress with your low-cutting boots. They look okay. They look cool. Ain't nothing wrong with it. But Portia just really felt she loved her body. She loved her assets. And she wanted to show it in the house of the Lord just like she showed it in them streets. Now, of course, you know you're going to have a motherboard on you and any other board uh, soliciting to try to tell you to dress appropriate. You know what I'm saying? But Portia wasn't hearing that. And, and, and it's okay because that's Portia's life. She goes on to say, I have been here in the club countless nights before watching the evening slip away, letting the hours roll by so I could forget about my ex that hurt, the parents at the daycare center, my dad. I kept running to the club hoping it would help me forget about all the things that uh, stormed my brain at night, haunted me, trying to find answers that I simply didn't have or maybe didn't want to have. And that's a good thing, portion when you uh, differentiate want to have and didn't have. That's something you wanted to do. You wanted to find relief in the club, but for some reason... The club life was just leaving you. And the probably the reason why I was leaving you. Because it was just redundant. It's something you had played out. Did so many times before. And it's not fulfilling anymore. So now she calls herself. Wanting to get married. Get married. You know. All that kind of stuff. And she went on to. You know ask certain questions. We all ask ourselves. Why are you here? What are you looking for? How did you get here? Don't you want something more for your life? Do you think you'll find it without me? So then, of course, you know, she goes home and tells her mom she had this epiphany in the club. And this, that, and the third. And she was just tired of the club scene and this, that, and the third. And she went and talked to her mom about it. And she said, Mom, I had an epiphany. I told her reach for more electrolytes to ward off my hangover that had my name on it. Okay, because she was clubbing the night before. She said, I was standing in the club. Last night, and I was looking at everyone there like, what are you doing? Why are you really here for? You know, same old scenario. And then uh, and then her mom said, well, what do you mean, Portia? What are you talking about? She said she heard a voice dripping and honeyed, understanding while she wiped down the counters in the kitchen. She said, I'm not sure what I mean, but last night in the club, listening to the same song, seeing the same people, I just decided the club life wasn't for me anymore. I, I don't want to be a single person anymore. I'm ready to be married. Are you supposed to be going out partying or are we supposed to be looking for something, for something more? So, of course, she told Portia, yes, you still have plenty of time to settle down, baby, and get married. You're only 26, so you have you don't have to rush into it just because you're sick of going out. So I was like, okay, you, you said some good reasons there, uh, Mama uh, Diane. She was only 26. What was the rush? She really wasn't dating anybody serious, so she hadn't found this uh, fulfilling man that she felt would give her the word and sit her down. Because, again, Portia don't like the word. She likes to talk a good game. Uh, she was on two good platforms to try to make some money, save some money, and do other investments if she uh, pursued that opportunity to do so. But, you know, even with the Simon guy, uh, she's uh, marrying, or Eeyore, they like to call him, because Simon's just the uh, name he's giving himself, but his legal name is Eeyore or something like that, Eeyore uh, Gabadia or whatever. But um, the point of the matter is... She's doing the same shit. From what I hear on the bloggers, Simon, her fiance, but I call glorified uh, boyfriend, he done purchased a home probably with some of Portia's money, but he didn't put Portia's name on the deed. That sounds just like what Cordell Stewart is doing to her 
as they get married and all this he didn't he wanted Portia to sign a prenup but he threw caution to the wind and he said he'll handle this itch another way and what came to transpire through uh He didn't put her name on the um, house that he had promised he was going to get her as a wedding present. He didn't have her on any health care insurance. And he called her himself giving her $1,500 a month for providing food for the family and any other necessities. But he never gave her like a stipend where she can go and treat herself. So she had a really controlling bastard. Uh, of a boyfriend and a husband but it just is what it is these are the type of men uh Portia uh seems to allot herself with but then you know when she was calling herself mean Cordell she thought it was an act of God and I'm like girl Satan can listen to your prayers as well but somehow they were having like this praise and worship thing and the um preacher she was under at the time was uh saying something like you know uh we're gonna have an altar call or a uh, prayer where you ask the lord what you want you know what i'm saying and uh the pastor was telling everybody to get in line uh to tell the lord what you want and basically poor she got in line and everything um uh, and she whispered in the pastor's ear uh and, and that it had laid on her heart that she wanted to ask god for a husband well, lo and behold, this man has got on the mic and told everybody Portia is wanting a husband. Portia here asked God for a husband. Let's all touch and agree that she finds that man uh, that God has set aside for her. Amen, church. Amen. Portia goes in and says, I felt my body melt to the floor from embarrassment. <laughs> she said, how could the pastor say this aloud? I, only, I was only telling the Lord, not the entire congregation. Lord have mercy. But I told the Lord what I wanted, and it, a year later, uh, there he was. And she's talking about Cordell. And I'm like, yo, old pastor was piss poor. If he didn't tell everybody else uh, business that they had told him in privacy between him and the Lord, and he just pray on it along with her, why did he take that particular time to throw you under the bus and say, oh, our uh, beloved child, uh, we call it uh, church mate, uh, she wants to uh, get married, and we're going to pray for her to get married, okay? <laughs> amen, amen. So that was just a piss poor. If he only uh, threw her under the bus and then throw the other parishioners under the bus or what they were asking the Lord for. Okay. She goes on to say she met Cordell in a club. Uh, um, when she was there with somebody uh, doing a birthday party or something, and Cordell's friend had came over there and said my friend is interested in you and she was you know being what she should have been when she was talking to these other men in these other chapters a little bit more forthcoming and tell the person what she gonna put up with and what she ain't gonna put up with and she, you know she was basically saying um I can't talk to you about your friend you need to tell your friend to come over here and talk to me if you want to talk to me pretty much and now eventually Cordell came over and said you know he apologized for sending his friend over he just was taken back uh, through all her beauty and this that and the third Cordell had introduced himself had told him a little bit about himself and that he was from New Orleans okay she felt that he was a manly man he was a very nice looking athlete athlete he kept his body in tune and he looked very nice in the suit even though she did throw a little shade there and said you know he was dressed uh, a little bit out of style because he was wearing those big lapels at the time but she liked him and she let us know that he was 10 years older older well, older than her so if she was 26 at the time he was 36 at the time okay so yeah he just saw somebody he could uh take advantage of and have the perfect trophy wife and this and the third or that's how he was going with it she even says he really wasn't a religious person but he did attend certain church services uh, with uh, her and her mom. Okay. And then as the rom romance really started taking place and, uh, and all of that, he used to take her to out-the-way places. He called one place in Duluth, Georgia. Fleming's was a nice restaurant they were taken to. She was taken to him, taken with him to have a nice dinner and stuff. She, she kind of liked it herself. Uh, but as the relationship kept going on and on and on, she felt like Cordell was trying to hide her 
uh, because they never really went out with his friends. Everything was like in a low bar, low lighting type setting. And it was just out the way from where they both live, which they both finally figured out that they live real close to each other, like in the backyard of each other. They both stayed in apartments or condos, however you want to see it. And, um, you know, he was playing games with her. She was playing games with him. Um, because actually he was engaged to a lady named Brandy at the time while he was being so uh, mysterious and stuff like that. But he never told uh, Portia at the beginning that he was engaged to somebody else. And, um, he was just taken back with Portia and her beauty and all of this. He was cheating on both women. And pretty much P Portia had called him out on his bullshit. And he had to come to the consensus that he really did have to, you know, tell her. But he did kind of help her out with giving her advice on her daycare, just business etiquette, and this, that, and the third. But he really wasn't giving out no money to her, just advice, uh, making on her a business plan that she can definitely um, go by and be prosperous if she followed those set rules. But she did uh, when they were dating, and Portia was trying to push him to another level. And he would seem like he was on board, but like I said, he didn't tell her about Brandy. So, uh, way after the fact that, uh, he had got into Portia's heart. And he could man manipulate her that way. But then, um, Portia was seeing red flags about him. A controlling nature side of him. Like when she would go out with her cousin named Tiffany. Um, he would disturb her. You know, we call her all, you know, like repetitively. Like every hour on the hour seeing what she was. And when she was out at after 10 o'clock, he said, you know, you're not one of them type of girls. You need to be at home. 10 o'clock is just too late for you to be out. This, that, and the third. And, you know, he was just getting on her nerves. And she was out trying to have fun with her cousin. But it just is what it is. Okay. And she ended up hanging up on him. But she never let him go or anything of that nature. Um, he was uh, taking her on different excursions. One time he took her to Las Vegas and he dropped 80000 on me just because uh, he wanted me to have the dream life. I didn't really say what he did, you know, uh, was she calling the plane? tickets into factor and the hotel they were staying at or was she basically just you know because what i don't know if he dropped clothes on her bought her stuff she didn't go into any of that but she just said he flew her to vegas vegas and they had a very nice i'm guessing week or weekend she didn't express that but she did express that he dropped eighty thousand on her or the trip itself okay um, and he showered her with this, that, and the third, and, um, it was still just like a real big hot mess, him going back and forth, um, uh, she had thought, he had told her she wasn't fooling around with her, or about her, to just, you know, come where he's staying, she could see what he, you know, is about, this, that, and the third, and see that he's not lying to her. Hine and Portia got the address, went on over there. And, you know, I guess he was waiting too long or something. Um, <clears throat> but he, she went on into the house thinking that, um, uh, he had bought her flowers because he had did so much uh, begging and pleading and hoping she would stay with him at this and the third. So she rushed in his apartment not knowing he wasn't behind her just yet. And she thought the flowers were for her. And this thing third, she picked up the car. Honey, it was from another woman. Um, <laughs> and then when, Porsche, when Cordell finally came in, behind her, he noticed she had found the flowers. She had read the card. And he was frozen, face frozen in the door. And she went on and attacked him and said, These are from your baby mama, I accused. And then he said, Brandon was thanking me because I gave her some extra money. No, this is bullshit. I'm not dumb. Don't worry, Cordell. I figured it out. Thank you for making it so obvious. You're hiding me. You're always talking about how, about her. And now here are these flowers. You just admit it. Admit it. You were still in love with her. And she said she broke up with him that night. It was over. And, you know, she stayed over. Wait a minute. It was over. And it wouldn't stay, wouldn't have stayed over if Cordell wasn't so good at begging. 
So it, it was just crazy. Of course, just going back and forth. But I understand because this other lady that he supposedly had the baby by, her name wasn't Brandy. It was, um, damn, some other name. Uh, it was, her name wasn't Brandy though. So I don't, I'm kind of confused. With the lady that I showed y'all in some of the pics with uh, his boy uh, that he had the baby by. But I don't know if this lady named Brandy. But that, that, that wasn't her name. If I can think of it, I'll include it in the next video. But uh, it is just what it is. Okay. Then he, you know, like I said, he went on and told her. Uh, he thought he was going to spend a new year. She thought she was going to spend New Year's Eve with Cordell. But he ended up spending it with... Um, his girl that he was uh women Cordell was catching me up on how he rained the uh new year in apparently he had spent the very first night of the year with brandy and his son brandy and his son my heart was so worn down by the news i refused to react and the next day i woke up and told uh he said he had spent the night with her and whatever and he said the next night they woke the next day he woke up from with brandon uh that i wanted to break off the engagement and you know Portia had an engagement wait what so she didn't even know that the man was engaged to brandy but she finally quickly found out and then he said well i had proposed to her and i haven't really broken it off and then i met you and uh then we were moving so fast and she said so that's why you were hiding that's what you were hiding from me and he goes that that's what your fiance say the entire time well she put the ring on the counter and i looked it back and i took it back so she's not my fiance anymore. I'm like, so how convenient? How convenient is that? And of course, you know, with that situation, Portia really felt that the man was on her side, this, that, and the third. But anyway, she ended up three years later. She was 26 at the time when she was courting Cordell. When she turned 29, they ended up getting married. Okay, she said Cordell told me that he had used his ex fiance's ring to create my emerald cut engagement ring. I wanted to cut my finger. It burned so bad from the um, false uh, past. I don't know what she was talking about. It wasn't even my style, but you still took it, Portia. You still took it and you ran with it and you married him with it, okay? So it was just a lot of here and there. Um, she felt that her mom was trying to stay out the conversation of the marriage and all of that. But, you know, <laughs> it is what it was. Uh, Diane kept her mouth shut. But she said when she was walking down the aisle with Mr. Cordell, she saw a black haze or a dark haze around her mother. And she knew it was like a bad omen. But she kept proceeding, okay? Then um, Cordell had asked her to just be a stay-at-home mom, this, that, and the third. And he was eventually going to buy her another daycare. But somehow, some type of investment plan that he was planning to use the money to get Portia her daycare ran off with $170,000 of his money. And so she was like, nah, I'm not going to bother him about the daycare business anymore. I don't know what he was doing with it or whatnot, but it is what it is. Cause she knew what kind of person that she had eventually had come to know and love and know and of course he paid three million dollars for their wedding portion didn't pay any of it um he assumed the cost for that and uh yeah portia had become the modern day kelp woman housewife uh and her mother had noticed that and didn't want to um really dim her light letting her know that hey you got a bastard for a husband child but you know most mothers would have just like me i would have told her i don't like them this is this is what i see this is what i hear and this is what i feel now if you still want to get married to them at least you could say your mama told you so and i'm gonna love you through it either way either or okay that was she could have had a conversation but she kept her mouth closed uh and you know she was just feeling overwhelmed me and portia because she was becoming not only uh a, a wife she was becoming a stepmom and you know she didn't really know how to handle that because you know she never had any children um and one child that she did have i think before this which was clinton that guy you know that was taken from her and she went to her mother for that and her mother told her to have an abortion so i'm like okay or she was okay with her alternative plans for the child um 
And it just talks about, you know, the big extravagant $3 million wedding he had put out on Portia, the nice gifts he had gave her. And then after the fact, Mama uh, Diane's going to say, you know, I just don't like how Cordell be saying certain things. Okay. Um, she was saying that uh, she didn't like that Cordell pushed her to give up her penthouse. Um, eventually I was okay with that because Cordell had promised me we'll build our dream home together. But thanks to my mother's side, I, I decided to hold on to the condo asking him to cover the 4000 uh per month mortgage instead. Now, eventually we found out later on, pulling forward to current year, we know she had lost the, um, the condo uh, because she had divorced Cordell. Cordell had divorced her and he was supposed to be paying the taxes on it. But uh, the taxes didn't get paid, so she lost the condo anyway. Um, then she was saying, her mom said, why is Cordell trying to make you buy another car? And then she said, because Cordell didn't like the leaking of the oil that it would sometimes transmit in the, um, I guess, in his perfect driveway or garage. She just got tired of seeing it. And Porsche was driving a Lincoln SUV at the time. And she thought it was fine. It got her from point A to B. She was a housewife, so she didn't really have to go a lot of places, you know. But he said, no, I'm just going to have to buy you a new car. And, of course, she didn't say the style or make of the car or model. She just said it was more of his taste, not her taste. She really wished that he would have let her have some type of say on what kind of car she wanted. But he didn't. He really didn't, child. So, you know, the mom was picking up on little things, but like I said, this was after the fact. She should have been saying it before that. So, Portia could have known for certain that, you know, her mom ain't liking this and this, that, and the third. And she really hadn't told her mom about a lot of things that had happened and transpired prior to her getting engaged and getting married. She kept it all to herself. So, after, you know, actually they got married and all this kind of stuff. Um, she said he became uh, mean spirited and controlling. Uh, she felt like the house that there he was building for them, or more so her, felt more like a fortress uh, of something she couldn't escape versus something lovingly and you know uh, romantically that she would be spending a lot of time at and making dreams come true, having more kids with him. But that wasn't the case. Okay, so. Um, like I, I told you earlier, he had gave her allowance about uh, 1500 a month. It wasn't enough to cover what I needed to take care uh, of a house size that they had along with, you know, taking, for, taking care of his kids and what he needed or his child and what he needed, which turned out to be a lot. Since Cordell, again, without including me in the decision making process, sued to obtain full custody of his son literally 30 days into their marriage so he um went out and uh his baby mama i don't know what he did to her or whatnot but um he felt like he needed to be in control of that situation too because i think the mother lived in another state and he wanted to raise his son uh with him under one roof and i don't know how he got full custody of her of the child but he ended up getting full custody and that was a hot mess too because he could have had joint custody he didn't have to go full fledged in doing that but evidently he didn't want to pay child support to his uh, baby's mama okay um and then Cordell started banning people from Portia's life you know being the controlling narcissist that she paints him to be okay she goes in to say your aunt talk too much. Your girlfriend talk too loud. Uh, your cousins don't use the coasters when they come and have a drink in the kitchen area on the table. It always leaves a ring. Then um, he said he didn't want her assistant to come over anymore. He banned her sister Lauren from the house. Uh, you know, kind of like alienating her from everybody. It was just going to be him, her, and his son. And that was crazy. It was very very crazy um then when her oldest well her yeah her oldest brother would bring his wife and children around you know she didn't have any children at the time except for her stepson and <laughs> chaplain um he kind of banished him from the place because he was saying 
the son was over there in the other property that he had bought next to his house so he had a little bit more privacy he had bought that lot and that piece of land and the, the kids are over there just tramping over it with their footprints i'm like what are they supposed to do that's what kids do they tap your grass and everything when they out there playing football baseball whatever but he didn't like that so her brother pretty much just packed up his children and left and she couldn't blame blame him i guess he probably said, i ain't coming back to you leave this crazy man or he made some major changes um and then you know she was trying to figure out uh, was Cordell trying to hold on to his sperm he was pulling out before he would actually have his ejaculation she didn't know what was going on just that and the third but for some miracle Portia said she got pregnant with a baby and she said Cordell wasn't really happy he wasn't really sad he was just like I guess stuck in a fog or something and um, make a long story short she wasn't going to be able to carry the baby full term uh, because she had an issue with fibroids and it was overtaking too much space where the baby needed to grow. The baby was still alive the first couple of months but then it had to end basically because it had nowhere to grow and Cordell called his cell leaving uh, when it's supposed to have been like a termination pregnancy that they were going to help her go through in the hospital but Cordell called himself uh, leaving before that time because uh, he needed to go to a golf tournament and so Portia ended up losing the baby uh, that, that same day he left in the bathroom or something like that and her mother had to take her to the hospital and you know make sure she was checking up she was alright and stuff like that and Mama Diane had words for him but again she could pretty much kept him to herself uh, and you know most moms would have went hell bent ass on his ass you know what I'm saying but you know Miss Diane must have had her reasons of why and she took it all in stride but uh, she didn't too much care for Cordial I'm, a, I'm guessing from that situation but that was a pretty eye opening of, uh, uh, type of uh, read about the kind of man Portia ended up with um Thank God she didn't um, have a baby by him because, uh, or brought into fruition for them because he probably would have took that baby from Portia just like he did the other baby mama if it was a boy. You know what I'm saying? So, God look out for you. You know, you make some stupid decisions and he tries to put the, um, the, uh, the warning signs ahead of you. But, you know, we be wanting what we want and we think we can change people and change situations. But you and the Lord can't both be working on the same issue. Either you're going to give it up to him and let him do what he need to do and work it out. Or you're going to be fighting a losing battle. Because he already know how that battle is going to be uh, deemed at the end. Because he started seeing it before you saw it. Uh, but, <laughs> whoo child, Portia just had to have her hands all over fame, fortune, and money. And so she's going to take and get it either way. However it's so fit. She saw the... Uh, you know, a man that was very intelligent. He was very well versed in the um, eyes of sports. And he was a sports commentator. And he was making good money. And, you know, like I said, her dream was always to be a housewife. And she got that opportunity to the be, be that. But she wasn't with the right mate. She wasn't evenly yoked uh, with someone in her spirituality to would allow her to make her own money be her own boss and still be able to you know come home and be a wife and a uh, mother to his child or to their child so uh he was very controlling she knew it from the beginning she still annoyed the signs that the lord was trying to give her like no baby this is not for me if she's causing you all this unhappiness all this chaos all this discord you know i'm only in the peacemaking business okay peace and serenity so you should have known that wasn't for me that was just satan you know trying to camouflage it because god don't get in no mess he don't send you don't mess so don't test him ever or question him ever when you see things out of out of court out of accord than what the norm is supposed to be which is peace love and, and forgiveness you know what i'm saying so portia no honey no that was just you and satan heard and he brought you the best looking mate that was fitting up to your expertise and your expectations and you took a hold of it just like you know me myself i thought you know my ex-husband was sent from god and this that third warning signs were all 
all there, you know, but he wasn't no narcissist, and, and I wasn't no narcissist, and he know I was more of a leader, I wasn't a follower, never have been, never wanted to be, you know, I can play a part of a team, but I rather do individual contrib con contributing work, but I kind of work by myself, okay, but um, that's all I have for this particular video, that section was very, very boring, but also uh, letting us know that you know in that sense of a uh, situation it happens it happens to everybody that wants to be a part of a relationship other than themselves when you start mixing with the same sex or the opposite sex and you're in a relationship you got to learn how to compromise and it was really from what Portia tells us from her side point her viewpoint he wasn't compromising he wanted everything his way or it was the highway so I'm sure most women and most men 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 and women know that feeling and either you're going to get with her or you're going to get out of it. It just is what it is. But thank y'all for joining me for another episode of Portia's um, Pursuit of Portia um, Messy Book. Okay. That she's telling on her experiences from her, her standpoint. Her viewpoints. Okay. That was five and six. So I'll be back. Hopefully later. But I'm not really sure. For seven and eight. That gets a little bit more juicy. And then I kind of understand why Portia leans to protecting her mother and providing for her mother not saying it's a good thing that diane is allowing her to do it but i do know diane is a senior citizen now and she got more days ahead i mean uh, behind her than ahead of her so i kind of changed a little outlook on her i won't be so hard on her because i know the feeling of trying to lose something i never lost anything like that i wasn't put in that situation but I could still empathize with her and how that may have happened. Now, with her mama and her, her dad, I, her mama's mama is what I'm saying. And her dad, I don't know what's going on with that situation. But I guess, you know, black families, you know, they do try to take care of their own when they can. And that's a good deal because we don't know what her mom and dad did for her, meaning Diane's parents, Portia's grandparents. But honey, that's the lady. I think I can't remember her name, but that's the one Cordell has the baby by. He never married her either. But it wasn't her name wasn't Brandy. It was some something else. I can't think of. Like I said, if I go back through the book, I think it's not really relevant. It's not really. So we don't really care. We just know that's the baby daddy. That's the baby mama of the son that Cordell has. Okay. But that's all I have for this video, guys. I will see y'all next time. Bye bye.